Welcome to the Queer Spirit Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Venagoni. Here we have conversations with artists, healers, and activists who enliven the LGBTQ communities and who empower our queer spirits to flourish. My guest today is Jack Davis. Jack is a visual artist, a witch, and a radical fairy. His most recent visual art show, called Faggots, was at the Center for Sex and Culture in San Francisco in January 2019. Today we talk about Jack's exploration of gender, sexuality, and activism through his art and ritual projects. One such being Faggots Around the Labyrinth, a ritual installation as a way of preserving power in the land and protecting queer youth just prior to the 2016 presidential election. Jack also shares how he discovered the radical fairies in the early 80s and how the fairies influenced him and many other queer folk over the following years. To see some samples of his work and to contact Jack, visit the show notes page at thequeerspirit.com. Hi, Jack. Welcome to the show. Hi, Nick. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, thanks for being here. So, Jack, you do a lot of different things, but you do a lot of art in different ways. And I wondered if you could start by sharing the story of how you first started making art. Oh, wow. Let's see. I went to a grade school where there were very few art opportunities. And I also went to a high school where there were no art classes. But in that environment, it became pretty obvious who the artistic people were because they very much stood out when somebody needed something done, they would come to the people who had done things before. So I was one of those people. When I went to college, I wanted to be an art teacher, but being an art teacher was such low status that I didn't tell anybody except my parents what I was going to, what my major was. And I would just tell everybody else I didn't know when they said what your major was going to be. So my first real official art classes were in college. And so I kind of, I was behind other people who had all of all through school. And I, um, since I was going to be a teacher, I took classes in a lot of different media. And textiles weaving was the one that was my home. That's where my focus was. And that's where I spent most of my time. And eventually got a master's degree in textiles. And... But I also, you know, made jewelry and I did ceramics and I did drawing and I did painting and sculpture. So I think I got a pretty good background. So that's how I started making art. And for my, when I got my master's, I had to do a a one person show. And in that show, I did some very technical wall pieces, wall hangings that I did on a big loom. And I also, crocheted penises because in early textile classes, well, most of my classes there were women in the classes and my teacher was a woman. And a lot of beginning weaving students, when they make pieces that are sculptural, did vaginal shapes. It was just kind of something that happened. And I thought, okay, well, I don't have a vagina, but I have a penis, so I'm going to make penis shapes. And one of the stories I remember is when I had my graduate show with my wall hangings and my crocheted penises, a graduate student who was teaching a class brought his students through the gallery to look at my show. And he picked up one of the penises and realized it was a penis and he dropped it right there, which really impressed me, which also convinced me that I wanted to make work that was so beautiful that people would want to pick them up. So that's how I started making art and started making penis shapes. Hmm. Well, that's really fascinating because I was going to ask you about that because when I first met you, you were making penis shapes. And so it sounds like you were primarily doing that just as a way to express yourself compared to the rest of your students. But I also wonder if it was part of your own queer sensibility or subtle activism through art. Sure. 70s was a pretty great time to be in school because there was a lot of activism happening around war. There was a lot of activism around race. There was a lot of activism around gender. As a man, I was dealing with feminism and the changes that were coming around with the second wave of feminism. And other men around me were doing the same thing. And so I was part of a men's group, So, which was not in retaliation, but 
as we saw, was kind of in collaboration or as allies to women. So that's part of where it was coming from, is let's glorify the sexual parts of women and also glorify the sexual parts of men. Mm -hmm. And then you, more recently, I believe, I don't know, you can let me know how far back this goes, but you've also been using the imagery of faggots and also using the term faggots in your artwork a lot. And where did that start? It's so long ago, I, I don't remember the actual idea where I thought I should do this. I did some research about where the word came from and what it means in different cultures. And I also know it's a triggering word for some people, but it's also for some people is a reclaiming of an identity. So it's a definitely a charged term. I recently, a couple of years ago, sent emails to everyone I know and asked them to respond to the word faggot with a statement or two. And that was very illuminating because I certainly have my experience with the word, but other people have other experiences. And I learned a lot. Like women get called faggot sometimes because for some people who are you know, using that epithet, faggot just means less than. So if you're not as good as me, you're less than me, which means you're a faggot. I also, and the image I use is a bundle of sticks. And that comes from referring to, particularly in Europe, and I think probably in the UK, a bundle of sticks is called the faggot. And I think there's a history to that where I think the word faggot actually means bundle. There is a story that has not been documented, but it's still a story that we hear, which is that when they were burning witches, in order to make a fire foul enough to burn a witch, they would bundle together a group of gay men and burn them. And so that is one of the stories about how the term faggot got attached to gay men. There's no actual written history of that, but it's still part of the stories that we tell. And also, you know, when we talk about oral history or handing stories down, that doesn't necessarily mean they're being written. So just because it's not part of the written history doesn't mean that it's not actually part of the history. And the other thing I'll say about faggot is that one of the things I learned is that the first written mention that people can find about referring to gay men as faggots actually was in the United States was in 1920 and refers and it goes back to again to the UK where the lowest person on the social strata was an old woman who had no money who lived by herself. And the way she could raise the way that she could get any money was to go and gather bundles of sticks for kindling for people to put in their fires. And that bundle was called a faggot. And as happens sometimes is that people who put things together or make things, they end up getting referred to as that term. So a woman who gathered a bundle of sticks was called a faggot because that's what she was making. And so I think the reference goes to this is the lowest person on the social strata. So gay men are therefore faggots because that's the lowest you can get. Mm -hmm. So in the story about your grad show of the man picking up the penis and having and then dropping it once he realized what it was, I'm curious to know how other people have responded to your art, particularly the penis art and the faggot art over time. And I'm primarily curious because I actually went to your recent show and that had imagery of faggots and penises and I posted it on social media. And this was a couple of months ago. And just the other day, my post was taken down because I used the word faggot in the description and they marked it as hate speech. Uh -huh. So I'm curious about how you've experienced other people responding to your art and possibly around censorship over the years. Huh. Well, there were a couple of, back in the old days, before we had, you know, cool cameras and before we had the internet, the way you would enter a show is you would take slides of your work and you would send slides to the people and the jury would decide what would be in the show based on the slides. So there were at least two shows where I sent slides of my penises, and they accepted the work. And then only when it arrived did they realize there were penises. And then both times, they didn't tell me I was being excluded from the show. So I showed up to see my work, and it wasn't there. 
And their explanation when I confronted them was, we didn't know there were penises. But that was in the 70s and 80s, and that's, you know, that's what happened back then. I occasionally get negative responses to the word faggot. I used to have a t-shirt that said the word faggot on it. And once or twice when I was out in public, somebody would come up and say, look, I find that word really offensive. And all I can say is, okay, thank you for that feedback. And I know mostly it's been from people who have been traumatized by the word. And I get that. And part of the discussion of the term is realizing that some people don't like the word and some people are traumatized by it. At the same time, when I sent out this email asking people about their response, I did hear a response from somebody who said, yes, I was traumatized by the word faggot when I was growing up. And now it has become part of my sexual repertoire that I can actually get sexually aroused by someone calling me a faggot. And it's one of the roles that we play. And, you know, that's part of it as well. Mm -hmm. And another aspect that you have brought into your art is ritual as a form of activism. And one of the pieces that you did more recently was Faggots Around the Labyrinth here in San Francisco. Can you tell us what that was about? Sure. There's this very cool labyrinth that is at Land's End in San Francisco, and it's been there for a very long time, I think since about 2004. And I've gone on to visit it a couple of times, and it's a very interesting spot. It's practically a 270-degree view of the ocean, and it is rock sitting on the ground. And the paths are pretty narrow, so that when you walk the paths, it's pretty easy to hit a rock and actually and move them. So it's not unusual to go to the labyrinth and see, oh, there's some rocks missing or they got moved. or, And also because it's a place of power, I think people are interested or are attracted to the space and feel like they want to interact with it. And sometimes I mean they take the rocks and throw them in the ocean. So that happened in 2015. I think all the rocks disappeared. And this very cool woman who is a, one of the people who is the, the de facto caretaker, and I'm looking up her name right at the moment, her name is Colleen Jurg, organized people to come and just rebuild the labyrinth. So part of what this was about was protecting labyrinth, but it also we did it in August of 2016 before the last presidential election. And I felt that we also need to think about protecting LGBT kids. So this is about protection. So I organized a bunch of people to come and help me do this ritual I'll talk about faggot patches in a little bit, hopefully. So I made caps with faggot patches on them. We went to the labyrinth. We made bundles of sticks. Uh, We went to the center of the labyrinth, and we did ritual about protection, about protecting the labyrinth and also about protecting LGBT kids. And the labyrinth is actually located on a path. So there are a lot of people who are passing through. So this was this is a very public space, and people were very respective and asked lots of really good questions. And I think I covered all the basics on that. Did I get everything, Nick? I think so. So okay. I'm curious how you felt the the ritual itself worked in the world. Oh, one of the things it does when you do something like this is it brings a certain attention to anybody who sees the information or participates to think about, oh, yes. LGBT kids need to be protected, and also labyrinth needs to be protected. And it also, anybody who's interacting or asking questions, you know, that information can be given. I think when we do rituals and we do spells, it's not like a football game where, okay, we're going to win this or we're going to lose this. It really is about putting the energy out there and being having a specific intention and not necessarily about there's a specific goal here. So doing one ritual about protecting LGBT kids is not going to make all LGBT kids protected for the rest of their lives all over the world. That doesn't work that way. But what it does do is it combines intention for a certain amount of time and puts it out there, you know, into the ether about, okay, these people have this intention and they're concerned about this in this moment. And that intention is going to stay there. And also one of the things it does is it, you know, if people remember they did this, when the issue comes up, they're going to remember, oh, right, I have this intention to protect LGBT kids. So those are my feelings I had afterwards. Like, I think it went really well. People had a good time. It was fun. It was well documented. We got some great photographs. 
And I also think it affected people who participated in it or people who heard about it and didn't even get a chance to get there, as well as the people who just happened to be walking on the path and see what's going on. Mm -hmm. Well, and also you made objects that people who were involved or were there could take away, such as the tile that has the image of the right. labyrinth with a faggot over it, and then the faggot patch, which you also just mentioned. And I wondered if you wanted to say more about that. Sure. I asked my roommate, Kamran, who is a better graphic artist than I am, to draw a picture of a bundle of sticks that we would then make into a silk screen. So he did that. And then together we silk screened a bunch of fabric and cut them into patches. And I would say it's probably, they're two different sizes. I think one is probably seven inches long and one is probably about four inches long. So I use those patches to put on baseball caps. So these are the people who helped me do the ritual. Each of them got a baseball cap. And I also use those patches when I do wall pieces. Pretty much it's, I mount the patch on a pre-screened canvas and then embellish the surface around it. And for some people, I can say, you know, this is an image of a faggot and this is where it came from. And for some people, I can say, yeah, it's a bundle of sticks. It's part of my current iconography. So speaking of queerness and ritual and magic, another reason I wanted to have you on the show is because I've had a lot of people on the show already who have referenced the Radical Fairies. And I know that you have been involved with the Radical Fairies for quite a number of years. And so I wanted to have someone on who could share with us a little bit more about that. So I guess to begin, can you give us a general overview of who the Radical Fairies are through your eyes? Sure. I'll start with some historical things. There was a group of men in L.A., a group of gay men in L.A., decided they wanted to have something called a gathering to get together gay men who were not assimilationists. This is in 1979. See, if Stonewall happened in 69, in 79, that was only 10 years of any kind of public gay male visibility. And what was beginning to happen, some people saw, is that there was a look that gay men were developing called the clone look, which was short hair, white t-shirt, and Levi's. And a lot of us who are hippies didn't do that kind of thing. And so we actually, we saw something as a mainstream gay culture was developing. And part of that mainstream was saying, hey, we're just like you guys, except for what we do in bed. And these men were thinking, well, actually, that's not who we want to be. And we don't think that's necessarily true. So they called themselves radical fairies. Radical as in political and fairy as, you know, as one of those epithets that we get called and focused on being anti-assimilationist, focused on these are the gay men who don't want to be like everybody else, who acknowledge that we have a specific purpose and we have a specific reason. Part of the, And part of that is we are different from other people. So the first gathering was in 1979. I didn't hear about the radical fairies till I moved to Santa Cruz in 81. And my first gathering was in 1982 when I went to Brighton Bush, which is in Oregon, for a winter gathering. And that's the first time I met up with Radical Fairies. And it felt like a homecoming, like, oh, these are the people I wanted. <laughs> these are the friends I went to have in high school. These are the people I went to have around me when I was growing up when I feel like I didn't have any allies. So that's kind of how it started. And I've been going to gatherings since then. Still continue to go to the Winter Brighton Bush gatherings when I can. And what happens in a gathering depends upon the tradition of that gathering, of course, but pretty much as people get together and they make the community. Sometimes it involves even making their own food. So for several days or a week, gay men who could call themselves radical fairies get together and create community. And now, radical fairies actually include all genders and all different kinds of people. The very beginning, it was the assumption was that radical fairies were men, but I think we've come a bit away. Ago. We've come a, a way since then. So, although there are gatherings that are specifically oriented toward 
male presenting or men, but there are also a lot of fairy gatherings that are open to all genders. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious how you specifically found the radical fairies, because I've heard stories from other people about how they came across them in this kind of mysterious way, or they found a flyer that was very vague, but attracted their attention. And, you know, because this was in the early 80s, there wasn't the internet then. And so people weren't communicating with each other in the same way. Right. The first gathering was advertised by Xeroxing, a bunch of flyers and sending them to bookstores and universities or possibly even libraries that might have a place to post a flyer. And I think I said I saw my, the first flyer I saw was in a bookstore in Santa Cruz. And now, of course, it's all over the internet and there are websites and that kind of thing and e-lists and things like that. So that's how I heard about the fairies. Or I talked to somebody who knew a fairy or talked to somebody who had actually been to a gathering. And then I started hanging out with fairies. And there's a local organization in San Francisco called Nominus that put together gatherings. And at some point, Nominus decided that they wanted to purchase land rather than renting land on a regular basis of gatherings to actually have land so that gatherings could always happen there. And I started going to their meetings and eventually I was their treasurer for a while. So when Nominus decided to buy land at Wolf Creek, I was the person who was signing the check to pay for the land every month. And eventually what happened is that, you know, this was in the early 80s. So AIDS was beginning to happen. And I eventually realized that most of the people I looked up to in the radical fairy community were, had died or were dying. And in a very short time, I realized, oh, I'm one of the few people here who has had a lot of experience and kind of saw myself in the role of, oh, right, yeah, I hold a bunch of this information. I thought there were other people doing that as well, but they're not here anymore. And then I think it was in 1999, something like that, Harry Hay was one of the people who started the first Radical Fairy Gathering. He never said that he wanted to be the founder of the Radical Fairies or called under the Radical Fairies, even though he acted like it, but he didn't want to have that title. Anyway, so Harry was the Grand Marshal in the San Francisco Parade, I think, in 1999. He lived in L.A. with his partner, John. And they came up here, and Harry injured his back on the flight. And what eventually happened is he stayed in San Francisco, and he lived here, and a group of Radical Fairies formed a care circle for him and John, found him an apartment and bought some furniture for them and made sure that they had care because Harry spent a lot of time in bed because of his back and other health issues. So I was one of the people as part of the care circle to take care of Harry and John. And then when Harry died, I we took care of John and, to, and then John died. Mm -hmm. And why do you think that the radical fairies have been so influential to queer culture? I think it goes back to the anti-assimilationist issue and also to the, which includes not accepting mainstream culture as the guide or the way to be. I think it's no accident that a lot of radical fairies were also part of ACT UP it, because radical fairies is not just trying to blend in, pretend they are just like everybody else. It really is about we have a culture here, we have a history here, and we have a space. And whether you give that space to me or not, I'm going to take it. Mm -hmm. And do you think that your experience with the Radical Fairies changed your own experience of your queer identity or your relationship to your art? Whoa, that's a pretty complex question. I hope like I can get to it. Yes, definitely. Meeting the Radical Fairies, I felt like I said, it was feel like coming home. These are people that I wanted to have around me that it nourished and encouraged me and also realized that I was doing that to other people as well. And so being visibly queer and being artistic and making things and showing them to people, I felt all of that was being very encouraged by radical fairies and also radical fairy culture. Seems like a pretty short answer to a complex question. <laughs> no, I get it. That's a whole thesis statement for you, I imagine. So I think that's a good nutshell answer. Good. Jack, can you share with us a person, practice, or experience that has supported your queer spirit to flourish? Sure, yes. Donald Engstrom, 
who lives in the Midwest, who is also a radical fairy and a witch, created this practice called Pagan Prayer Beads. In a nutshell, I try to do nutshells, but I don't always succeed. In a nutshell, it is like a rosary. And it's like um, you put together a string of beads, and each bead has a thick focus or prayer or honoring or affirmation and put them in any order you want to and you decide what things you want to include what you don't include if you, there are people you want to pray for you can have a bead for them as well and then i try to do that every day just go through and honor or pray for these specific things affirm the parts of me all the various parts of me things that i parts of my body i want to take care of and remind myself i want to take care of of blood, ancestors of spirit, hope for the future. And right now, I think my prayer beads are probably like two yards long. I just revised them and added some new things just the other day. And it just takes a few minutes to go through. Yeah. So it's not just something that is static. It's something that you're continuing to revise and evolve over time. Right. Yeah. Hmm. I like that. So Jack, where can people find you or contact you to learn more about your work? Well, I don't have a website, but they can email me if they have any questions. And my email is J-A-C-K-D underscore G-V at yahoo.com. Okay, great. Well, I will have your email on the show notes as well as a few images of your art so people can see some of that. Cool. And thank you for being here and sharing your story. And thank you for having me on your show. Do you feel lost or stuck? Or are you alone on your healing journey? If you're seeking guidance or support, I'm here to help. I offer online coaching and counseling for queer spiritual folks from all over. Schedule your free consultation with me now by going to QueerHealingJourneys.com. I look forward to supporting you on your path. To find the resources we discussed today, find the show notes at TheQueerSpirit.com. And if you enjoyed the show, remember to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. This will help us reach and support more queer people all over. Thanks for listening and see you next time. 